this amalgamated company that's formed in 1685 um, causes theater to suffer tremendously. The competition that exists, the quality of the plays, right? The competition that exists between the King's Company and the Duke's Company was great for the theater, but the amalgamated company's not. And so what happens is an opportunistic businessman named Christopher Rich swoops in and buys the company up. And um, he has <laughs> he has a whole host of friends and investors who are not particularly invested in the theater and don't intend to take very good care of it. They now own a monopoly on this powerful and popular, you know, uh, art form. And um, so what they do is <clears throat> they turn it into a business venture and want to make as much money out of it as they can. And the way to do that is to take it out of the actors. Now, the actors um, have a very well established, even for the short period of time the theater's been back in operation, remember a lot of these people were actors before the interregnum, very well established sort of pecking order amongst themselves, hierarchy, uh, and entitlement system, right? They get, they get benefits, they get retirement benefits, um, they have um, uh, benefit shows exclusively, where the money goes exclusively to uh, the lead actors and the companies. And so Rich wants to slash all of this and they throw a fit, is essentially what happens, and they walk out. The reason that they're able to do that, right, the reason why Rich had miscalculated what he could get away with in terms of trying to turn a profit from the United Company is that <clears throat> for the first time in history, really, we have actors during the Restoration who are public and popular figures. So Thomas Betterton is probably the most famous and powerful tragedian of his day. Originally, he begins with the Duke's Company, but when the United Company forms, he becomes not only the lead, uh, lead actor of the United Company, but for all intents and purposes, it's... Um, it's day-to-day -day manager. Uh, he becomes the leader of the company, and it's public face. He's enormously popular, as is Elizabeth Barry and Anne Bracegirdle. And so the actors decide um, that they're not going to take it. And so not unlike um, modern-day high-profile sports strikes of the sort that's happening right now um, in hockey, uh, the actors decide that you can't do this without us, and so they walk out. Uh, and as it turns out, they're right. So they go to the king, who's William III at this time, and they get a special permission to perform, and they form their own company, set up with very rigid rules about the way in which um, the company will operate so they can't sort of be swooped, so they can't be um, undermined by uh, any opportunistic uh, businessmen the way that the United Company was. Um, and so what you have now is you have two companies again in London and genuine competition, which is lovely. Uh, the consequence, though, of this is that because... <laughs> Uh, only the actor's company is performing drama. The United Company has to stay afloat somehow, and so they resort to essentially becoming a circus, is what happens. Animal shows, you know, fire breathers, a lot of spectacle and no narrative, essentially, is what happens. Um, no actors of consequence, um, trapeze artists and jugglers and things of that sort, um, which does draw in business. It also ultimately expands the audience um, for restoration drama, interestingly. So now... Um, we'll say middle class and merchant class people are going to the United Theatre. They're also going to the Actors' Company. <clears throat> uh, we have um, uh, a whole servant class for the aristocracy that suddenly the theatre's opened up to. And, of course, the aristocrats themselves are still going. Um, so while the Actors' Company is actually doing dramas, one thing that happens to them as a consequence, because they have to compete, is that they begin incorporating these, these um, we'll say, circus elements or low-performance elements into their, into their productions. Um, so, like, um, you know, boys' choirs and um, people on horseback doing, uh, uh, doing narration and things like that that aren't explicitly connected to the narrative itself, but are sort of these spectacle elements that are intentionally meant to compete with what's happening with the United Company. Uh, but ultimately, this is pretty good for the theater. Now, something else that we've already talked about, but let's touch again on it briefly, is that um, we have actresses on the stage for the first time with Charles II's return, um, Elizabeth Barry being the, the foremost among those, but also, as we said, um, Anne Bracegirdle, and, uh, and Nell Gwynn, and Nell Gwynn, N-E-L-L-G-W-Y-N, -L -L you'll need to know also for the exam. Um, Nell Gwynn is Charles II's um, mistress, so uh, she is she is well known, and then um, Susanna Mountfort, M O N T F O R T, for whom I think we already talked about this. The pants drama or the breeches role is created, right? Um, and she had a whole host of breeches roles in plays in the sixteen seventies, sixteen sixties, and sixteen seventies. Um, the breeches roles are interesting, right? Because these are cross dressing roles for women. Um, 
modern feminist scholars, right, will talk about these roles in a multiplicity of ways. There's one line of thought that sort of says the notion of dressing a woman up as a man and allowing her basically to assume the role of the restoration rake afforded her a certain latitude in society that wouldn't have been available to her otherwise, and that these were really um, empowering images of women for women to go see in the theater. The sort of countervailing thought is that really what this was about was getting a woman into a pair of short, tight pants so that men could oogle her. And a lot of the ancillary evidence that comes from people's diaries and journals about what was driving attendance at the theater seems to confirm this, that men really like to go and see women, uh, you know, and in legitimate theater, not wearing not wearing much. But I think it was broader than that, too. Audiences were being driven to the theater, particularly as we get into the 1670s and 1680s, to see women in roles they had never seen them before. So yes, um, uh, you know, women in uh, plots of sexual intrigue during the hard comedies is pretty interesting. But then as we move into the soft comedies, um, what we really get are um, pathetic comedies, right, they're called, and pathetic dramas, which are concerned with, you know, women's stories. And we have a plot shift, as we've said before, from uh, battle of the sexes and um, questions of romance inside the marriage, I mean outside the marriage, to inside the marriage. So what's happening is that um, women are suddenly claiming their space, right, in the theater in this moment, and really beginning to drive and shape uh, the theater in a way they never had before. And this happens in conjunction, right, with William and Mary assuming the throne. But as I said, William's on the continent and Mary's on the throne. And so in the way, just as it was with Charles II, where we saw sort of Charles's concerns driving um, playwriting in this period, suddenly um, Mary's ascent to the throne is driving uh, uh, a topical shift in the theater. So we also have to mention, of course, Afra Ben, who is the first female playwright, who is also emerging in the 1680s, and she is really the linchpin between the hard comedies of um, John Dryden and of Weisherly and of George Etheridge, uh, who are writing that sort of macho um, court drama, the hard comedies, right, uh, and the emergence of the soft comedies. And the soft comedies are being written uh, for these female actresses, and written, um, I think, to a greater degree with female audiences in mind who are swelling during this period, right? And so the authors um, we need to be concerned with of the comedies in the later period are um, William Congreve, uh, John Harbaugh. Um, uh, particularly of interest is um, The Way of the World, Congreve's Way of the World, right? Um, in 1700, which caps off this sort of period of playwriting. And um, these soft comedies are domestic, as I think I said, in many ways they sort of reflect, um, if we want to sort of trace their family lineage, they sort of go back to the domestic comedies of the Hellenistic period. Um, they're concerned with intrigue inside marriage and with uh, questions of love inside marriage, and frequently feature a long-suffering female protagonist. Um, and then there's also the the sentimental drama, the she tragedy, and that's sort of the, the complementary form. The playwrights there that you want to concern yourself with are um, primarily Thomas Otway, who wrote The, Al who wrote the Orphan in 1680, uh, John Banks, uh, Nicholas Rowe, Anna Bulin, and Lady Grain J. Um, and tragedy, right, is going to overtake. There is actually a final third period of the Restoration, which is between 1700 and 1710, that last decade. And in that last decade, um, Restoration comedy goes away. It really disappears. It's gone um, by 1710. Um, <clears throat> the last sort of vestiges of Charles II washed into history. And there's a rapid shift culturally um, uh, towards seriousness and interest in, in um, tragedy. This is because there's a lot of political and social tumult happening in Europe at this time. Um, there are major shifts occurring in France. Um, there is some dissatisfaction with the aristocracy in England. Obviously, this is not where the revolution is going to be. Um, but there is um, the emergence of sort of different class consciousnesses in a way there hasn't been before. Uh, William and Mary are not fans of the theater. And um, so while Mary is on the throne and her sort of concerns are being reflected by the drama, by, by drama um, they're sort of disinterested with it. And um, so restoration comedy... Uh, Restoration comedy goes away. Note here is uh, John Collier, C-O-L-L-I-E-R's uh, tract, 
the short view of immorality and profaneness of the English stage, written in 1698, in which he attacked Congreve and Van Buren, um, and the entire form <clears throat> of Restoration comedy. And uh, it is said that his tract, his treatise, got so much traction because it reflected a shift that had already really happened in public tastes, away from that kind of comedy and towards the seriousness of tragedy. Uh, and that's it. So that's what we need to know about the Restoration. Um, when we reconvene on Monday, we'll see the German Enlightenment presentation. On Wednesday, we'll talk about the Italian and French Enlightenment. And on Friday, we're going to talk about the German Enlightenment. And then, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be very close to the end. Um, we'll take Monday and talk about Faust. And then the following Wednesday, we will simply review for the exam. So I hope you had a lovely holiday. And um, I'll see you all next week. Be well.